Good morning. It's good to be with you all this morning. Thank you for uh, having me here. It's been a while since I've been here. And it was actually before that season of COVID, um, right before it, I was, I was here um, with you all. And if you don't know who I am, my name is Rowan Crown. I'm pastor of Amazing Grace Community Church. But the first church where I served was actually here at Crestwood. Um, I was telling some people before the service, it's been 17 years um, that uh, we, we left here. And now all my kids who are like the kids that age there, uh, my youngest, Phineas, just graduated from high school. Um, and uh, my daughter, Abigail, is at UofL after spending two years at um, Grand Prairie playing basketball up there. And Isabel is uh, also in Lethbridge and uh, about to go to the University of Lethbridge for uh, uh, nursing and pre-nursing. So time flies when you're having fun. Or as Eric said, when life just happens. Uh, and uh, it's true. So it's good to be with you. Uh, thank you for supporting us through prayer and your financial giving through the year. It's, um, it's, it's been a blessing. And I do encourage you, um, if you want to hear a brief update about uh, more what's going on with us at Amazing Grace, we would love for you to just stick around for uh, five to ten minutes. Pastors need that kind of like range to, uh, of time. Um, because we don't really know how long we're going to speak. So uh, uh, please join us. I do admire the kids this morning. Did you see the gusto in which they said, thanks be to God, right? Could you imagine if we did that after the, after the service, right? Jump up and you know, thanks be to God. It would be great, wouldn't it? Um, it, would be, it would be awesome to fill this place with that. This morning, if you would turn in your Bibles to Psalm 91, Psalm 91, and I do appreciate Chris's children's message because it was great. I, I don't even know if I have to preach this morning. You know, that's Jesus is your rock. Amen. Let's go. Right? Um, we can do that. But turn your Bibles to Psalm 91. I'm going to read the whole psalm and I'm going to focus on verse 1 and 2 this morning. Psalm 91 He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the pestilence and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will, it will not come near, your, near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample on the foot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. And show him my salvation. It was 12 years ago, about this time of year, we had been doing one of our camps in Lethbridge. As part of our ministry in Lethbridge, we have been doing camps for uh, kids in the community for many, many years. And we were doing one of those camps. We had teams come. Uh, it was an incre incredible week. We saw... 90 kids come to these camps, and, and for two weeks we were on task with uh, praying for, seeking, and loving the community in which God had called us. And uh, we hosted uh, a team from North Carolina. They did an incredible job in helping presenting the gospel to the kids. We had an end of camp um, barbecue with a pool where we had over 250 people from the community come and, and join us. We had a worship service with many of those community people 
came and, and, and joined us. It was, it was one of those great ministry highs that uh, you have in, in ministry. At the same time, I really believe that Satan was trying to discourage us. And there was a little bit of division that occurred within um, our church planning group. And it, it was not an easy time in, in, in some regards. And like the crowns always do, we make things difficult. We decided the very next day, after those two very heavy weeks of ministry, that we would go on vacation, not knowing that after two weeks we'd be totally exhausted. And we had our tent trailer packed up, our bikes. I still got a picture of all our bikes and strapped down with the skill of Rowan's tying, um, which is not very good. And uh, lots of bungees, lots of ropes, lots of straps, probably too many, but I didn't want anything to go wrong. And so we start heading south towards um, West Glacier. And I don't know whether you've crossed the Del Bonita border at all in, in southern Alberta, but it's like a shack, right? You know, and then you hit a dirt road going into Montana and coming off the dirt road, lo and behold, our tent trailer lost a tire. Now, has anyone tried to change a tire on a tent trailer? I, I hadn't up until then. I thought it was just a normal fix. You know, you jack it up and, you know, you replace the tire and everything like that. But no, once again, we got this tent trailer for free. Rowan thought, I know how to do this. We were stuck on the side of the road in Montana with no tire. Well, a family from Australia stops by and helps us. All the Canadians come by, you know, but it's a family from Australia who stops by and helps us. And he says, mate, what are you doing? I said, where are you from? From Australia. I said, okay, good. Um, can you help me? He said, yeah, I'll help you, mate. And so we, we finally got the tire on and, and what we didn't do was tighten the, uh, the uh, bolts on the wheel and we get into Browning, Montana. Has anyone been to Browning, Montana? Yes. Not exactly the metropolis of Montana. And the bolts of our tire had fallen off. And so for three hours, my wife and kids sat on the side of the road while I searched every mechanic place in Browning to find the right bolts for the tire. So finally, we get to our beautiful KOA West Glacier campsite, and we're tired. We set up camp, and after we set up camp, we're ready to relax. We picked up Rebecca's parents who met us in Kalispell, and we brought them to the camp. We set up camp, and guess what happened? A thunderstorm came, flooded our camp. Tents were soaked. Um, uh, many of you know my wife. She grew up in a military home. Her dad is a retired colonel. Of course, he wanted to take command, and it was chaos at camp. Chaos at camp. And we were tired. We were worn out. We were discouraged. We were hurting. We started our vacation, and my kids were young back then. They would explore around the camp, and there was a single guy in the campsite next to us. And... You remember my kids are always curious. They always found their way into other people's camp saying they've got better food than us, um, which usually they did. Uh, uh, and so um, they would wander over to this man's camp and we would go hiking in the West Glacier National Park and we went on a hike and, and this same man was hiking in the same group as us. I was like, well, that's strange. And then a couple of days later, he came over to our camp and he introduced himself. He said, my name is Patrick. I used to build airports all around the world. And God called me here to come to West Glacier this summer just to be used by God. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. That's kind of strange, you know, uh, um, to be able to do that, to choose to come to this beautiful area and so forth. And as the conversation went on, he said, I don't know who you are, but the moment you showed up, 
I sensed that I need to pray for you and your family. He said, for the past three mornings, I've been getting up at 4 a.m. and praying Psalm 91 over you. I was like, wow, that's really cool. Well, the next day, we went to go on a hike. We showed up, and there's two big boxes of goldfish, um, a, a bunch of um, uh, juice boxes, and we're like, who brought this? And we looked over, and there's Patrick waving and saying hello. Rebecca's parents um, were not believers, and he came and said, look, I want to take you guys out to dinner. He took us to the most expensive restaurant in Kalispell and spent three hours sharing the gospel with Rebecca's mom and dad. Phineas was playing in the playground, fell 14 feet down and, and hit, his, hit his chest right on the ground. And guess who was there before us? Patrick. And he just laid his hands on Phineas and began to pray for him. Those two weeks were quite amazing. Because literally, as we're on vacation, we have... A chaplain who's praying for us. Towards the end of my time there, I went to see Patrick and I went there in tears. And I said to him, I said, Sir, why are you doing this? And he said, Well, you ask God why I'm doing this because he has laid you and your family on my heart to pray for you. And he said, you will face many trials. You'll face many snares. You'll face many things in your ministry. But remember Psalm 91. Remember that God is your fortress. Since then, the last 12 years, Psalm 91 is a psalm that I've gone to many, many times Two years ago, we were invited to go into the midst of uh, standoff, the um, reserve right next to Lethbridge, in the heart of the reserve, in the middle of a very addicted, drug-infested area where we as a white, mostly white evangelical church was, uh, was asked to run a camp for kids in the heart of standoff. Three days we went out there in the hot sun and we shared the gospel with these kids we were allowed to. There was wild dogs, literally wild dogs who would come to our camp and bark at the gate and they had to come with sticks and golf clubs to chase them away. Every time we drove out to standoff, I would read Psalm 91 to the people who were volunteering because we needed God as our fortress. And with that long introduction of this, of, of, of this passage, it sets the stage of what I believe that this psalm is speaking to us. That God is our fortress. First, verse 1, there's two points this morning. So trust me, if you're looking for a third, there's not going to be one. Um, two points. First, setting up camp in God's fortress. Verse 1 of Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Many attribute this psalm to Moses. And it's clear here that the psalmist, if it's Moses, he, he, he basically says the mindset and the unconditional priority of the follower of God is to dwell in the shelter of the Most High. That word in Hebrew, to dwell, means to set up camp. Literally, it means to remain and live. It's a conscious decision to say, out there without God is dangerous. But in my shelter, in my fortress... You will have my rock, my steadfast love, my unconditional love. 
says to, he dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And the, the words in the shelter means a covering, a refuge, a hiding place. I know many of you know the Dutch watchmaker, Corrie ten Boom, who with her father and her sisters and family members went to help many Jewish people escape from the Nazis during World War II by hiding them in their home. When she was caught and arrested and sent to the Ravensbrück concentration camp, it was by her efforts and by the strength of the Holy Spirit in her efforts, she found and shared hope in God while she was imprisoned in the concentration camp. The book that she writes that tells of this is called what? The Hiding Place. This is what she writes. Life in Ravensbrück took place on two separate levels, mutually impossible. One, the observable external life grew every day more horrible. The other, the life we live with God grew daily better. Truth upon truth, glory upon glory. Concentration camp was horrible. We, we couldn't even imagine what people went through. But her mindset and her, and her unconditional priority of the follower of God, she dwelt, she encamped, she set up camp in the shelter, in the covering, in the refuge, in the hiding place of the Almighty. And despite the horrific conditions of people dying, of seeing friends being tortured, she experienced truth upon truth, glory upon glory. Isn't that beautifully and humbling? Isn't this a picture of what it, what it means to live in the shelter of God in the midst of the struggles that she was experiencing? And just like the psalmist here, Corey has said, my rock and my fortress and my shelter is Lord God Almighty. The psalmist uses the word the most high, which in Hebrew is Eliyon, which is he is the creator and ruler. And so when we set up camp or put our shelter in this fortress, it's not a flimsy fortress that will blow away. It is a fortress, a, a place that is created by the creator himself. It is ruled by the King of Kings and, and, and the Lord of Lords, the creator and sustainer and the a king of all kings. In Daniel 3.26, it tells of this word, El El Yon, when it says this, that then Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of El El Yon, the most high God, Come out of here. Come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Well, most of us, and if you don't know this story, it's okay. It's a crazy story. But it's a story of three young men who set their mind to put their life in the fortress of God. When a decree went out to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar, these three men did not bow. And as a result of not bowing, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And that's why that word describing God there is so important because what happened was God El Elyon, the creator, sustainer, the king of kings, what did he do? He protected these men in the fiery furnace. In fact, in verse 25, King Nebuchadnezzar says, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. When King Nebuchadnezzar looked into the fire, Ephonus, and saw that they were protected, the only thing he could do is say, There is a king that's greater, greater than I am. 
There is a creator who protects these men. And it looks like there's the son of the gods who is there with them. And many commenters say this is Jesus Christ who has come to protect them. What happened to these men in the fiery furnace was absolutely impossible. When King Nebuchadnezzar looked in, he saw these men protected. Then the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, who all these people were bowing to, proclaimed that God is the God who is the creator, who stopped creation from burning these men. And he must be the king. He must be the God Almighty because he is the great and mighty king that wouldn't let his servants die in the furnace. These men set up camp in God's fortress. He protected them. He protects us. When persecution comes, when fiery trials come, when struggles come, God in his sovereignty is there for us. Secondly, this God is a mighty fortress that can be trusted in all seasons of life. Verse 2, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, in God whom I trust. The older I get, the more God puts me in places that I continue to have to learn this truth. God is the only one I can put my trust in. Why? Well, one, because he says so. That's what the Bible says. Put my trust in me. I have chosen you. I have called you by name that you put my trust in me. Second, because he's proven so. He's proven that over and over again. Scripture records, and that's why I love the Old Testament. Last year in Amazing Grace, we took the challenge to read through the whole Bible. And as I read through the Old Testament, it was reminder after reminder after reminder of men's foolishness, but God's greatness, God's power and our weakness. And three, because nothing compares to this almighty God. Nothing compares to El El Yon, the creator and king of all. See, there are compelling and competing voices out there that say, trust yourself. Believe yourself. Trust your gut. You'll find it deep within your own self. Well, I know that doesn't work. My gut's got me into a lot of trouble. It's a big one. It gets me into trouble all the time. Trust karma. Do good things and good things will happen to you. Do bad things and bad things will happen. Trust in your resources and money. Trust your people, your family, your friends, your TikTok community that you have out there. You don't even know. You just see 30 seconds of them every now and then. Trust them. They'll have your back. They'll be by your side. You'll be okay. Now, let me tell you, I want to let you know that doing good things for people is good. Having money and taking care of your resources is a good thing. Having friends and relationships around you are not bad. But what the psalmist is saying is all those can fall away. All those can discourage you. All those can leave you. God is the one who can be trusted 100 Percent. Psalm 20, verses 7 to 8 says, Some trust in chariots and some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Now remember, he was mighty and successful king, and he won many battles, but he knows that it's only trusting in God. It's only trusting in God where one will truly find refuge, where one will truly find refuge. Strength. And then Psalm 62, 8, it says this, Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. 
God is a refuge for us. Today, where have you decided to set up camp? When I've shared the gospel with many people in Lethbridge, I actually appreciate when someone tells me, I don't believe this, Rowan. Like, leave me alone. I'm like, okay. All good. Because I can't convince them. But I pray for them. And some of them have come back and said, you're right, Rowan. I want to be saved. Some people fall in the camp of the I'm right camp. I've got to be right in everything. I've got to show my strength by being right. Politically, religiously, in everything. Some fall in the camp of the Sunday camp. Right? The Sunday camp is this. We look good on Sunday. We worship God. We give about tithes. We do all these things that look pleasing to God. Yet, during the week, we may treat our spouse in ways if people knew. We go on the screen on the internet or on our cell phones and access websites that are harmful to our soul. We may be, do business poorly with others. My neighbor who lived next to us many years ago, I was making wine with him in his basement and he was asking about my church and he said, I could never be a Christian. And I said, why, Mike? And he said, well, I work for a boss who has all these certificates on the wall about his, his giving to Christian schools and, and different ministries and so forth. And he, he shuts up shop on Sunday to obey the Sabbath, but he treats his employees like they're nothing. He misses our paycheck sometimes. And... He is not kind to me. See, we can pretend to live in God's fortress, and we can do a good job of that. Yet, God says, do not pretend, do not put your own camp together, but you need to set up camp in the camp of the Almighty. How are you managing this season of life that you are in? Have you, because of circumstances, because of the frustration or struggle or things that come at you, have you decided that I'm going to abandon the camp of the Lord and I'm going to create my own safe camp? There's a growing world out there called exvangelicals. Look it up, hashtag exvangelicals. And they're leaving the traditional gospel and creating basically a, a, a Christianity of their own that is safe and secure for them that they create in the image and likeness of their own God and forgetting the God who loves them. Early in Jesus' ministry, a Pharisee approached Jesus and the basic question he asked, and I'm going to summarize it, is how do I know you are from God? Or even how can you be from God? And Jesus responds with probably the most ever quoted verse, verses in the Bible, John 3, 16 to 18. He says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the Son, of the only Son of God. See, this God, a mighty fortress, came to us. God knew that, he, that we needed a refuge. God knew that we needed a tangible living shelter. God knew that he had to come in the form of his son. And he came. as the son of man and the son of God. And he entered this fiery furnace of this world. He came to live with us. And he entered this fiery furnace. And let me tell you, 
This world is a fiery furnace that will burn you up. And what he did is he came to save, rescue you, and deliver you. Yes, we love those sermons where we call people to repentance and we say, if you don't believe in Jesus, you will, when you die, you will go to hell, right? And that's a truth. If you don't believe in Christ, your eternal life is not secure in the heavenly realms with Christ. But let me tell you, the older I get and the longer I've been in ministry, I need saving in this world now. Because Satan is after our kingdom. And he'll divide and he'll distract and he'll discourage and he'll take away, he'll tear apart. He'll cause division within relationships. I've made a commitment. I can't share the gospel with someone in the world if I can't reconcile with my brother and sister in Christ. If I have issues with someone who loves the Lord Jesus Christ and I can't reconcile, how can I share the love of Christ to someone who doesn't know him? And so Jesus comes and he comes and he rescues us. Not from fiery trouble out there. But as Chris said aptly this morning, the fiery trouble in here. When we trust in him, he will give us eternal life. He will allow us to live and dwell in his kingdom. That's why Jesus is the only way to God. See, it's very appropriate we come to this table this morning. It's, t- it's temple, it's, it's fortress rations. It's camp food. Camp food that God gives for us to be reminded of, of his sacrifice for us. Fortress food that not only reminds us, but what we believe as 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 Reformed Presbyterians, that as we take this meal, God's presence is with us. In fact, as my professor in seminary said, when we take this meal in faith, it's like we sit in the heavenly realms with Christ. And we're sitting beside him. And he's reminding us that he is our God. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He is our deliverer. This morning, as we take this meal, we can say, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God in whom I trust. When I've shared this story about Patrick, a lot of people have said, have you been in contact with him since then? Well, we had one call. But let me tell you, I really believe God sent him there for us that summer. And his testimony of giving himself over to God to allow him to minister to crazy, messed up pastor and his family like us is a reminder that God is our fortress. He is our strength and our deliverer. And he wants you to camp with him today. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, help. Lord, this morning we have people grieving over the loss of loved ones. We've probably got families who are struggling. It's probably sickness and unrest in maybe people's physical and emotional health. But Lord, we are thankful that we can go to your word and we can lift you up and say, God, you are El El Yon. You are the creator, the sustainer. You are God Almighty. And Lord, you desire to rescue us And you desire to save us. 
and you desire to meet with us and, and have a meal with us and nourish us in your fortress. So Lord, we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.